Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this very special event, the induction of the inaugural Vincent J. Dooley Distinguished Fellow of the Georgia Historical Society. My name is Todd Gross, and I have the honor of serving as the president of the Georgia Historical Society, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you to this evening's ceremony. As we begin, I would like to recognize and thank a number of generous people without whom this fellows program would not have become a reality. First, I want to recognize the members of the board of the Georgia Historical Society's Board of Curators who have joined us this evening, Ellen Bolch, Dolly Chisholm, and Errol Davis. I would ask you please give them a round of applause. I also want to recognize our very special guests this evening. They are the immediate past chairman of the board of the Georgia Historical Society, Vince Dooley, and his wife, Barbara, and Dr. Walter Evans and his wife, Linda. And you'll be hearing more about all of these folks later in the program. So please give them a round of applause. In order to establish the Dooley Fellowship Program, the Georgia Historical Society raised over $1.2 million in endowment funds. The campaign was led by Jim Blanchard of Columbus, Billy Espy of Atlanta, and Wick Knox of Augusta. On behalf of the Georgia Historical Society, I want to express my deep appreciation to them and all of the donors that are listed in your program book. You can find their names in there, including our lead sponsor, Delta Airlines, Delta Airlines donated $100,000 towards this worthy cause. The selfless commitment of these donors to history education is exemplary, and I ask that you please join me in thanking all of them with a hearty round of applause. In 2016, Vince Dooley was elected chairman of the board of the Georgia Historical Society the governing body of our institution. At the time, it seemed like the capstone of a personal commitment to the study of history that began back in 1963 when Coach Dooley earned a master's degree in history from Auburn University. But the Board of Curators of the Society wanted to do something that would honor Vince beyond just chairmanship of the state's premier historical institution, something that would permanently associate Coach Dooley's name with teaching and writing of history. They wanted to create something unique that would secure Vince's legacy as a historian and would allow him to continue in perpetuity to influence how the public understands the past. So without his knowledge and as a surprise tribute to him, the Board of Curators created the Vincent J. Dooley Distinguished Fellows Program. The funds to endow the program were raised over a two-year period, and we surprised Vince with an announcement of the program's creation at the Georgia Historical Society's Georgia Trustees Gala this past February. So here's how it works. There are two types of Dooley Fellows, Research Fellows and Teaching Fellows, and they are selected in alternating years. Dooley Research Fellows are generally young scholars who are writing a dissertation or a first book. They will be awarded a fellowship stipend that will allow them to travel to Savannah to spend time doing research in the vast archival collection of the Georgia Historical Society. Dooley, te Dooley Teaching Fellows, like the one that we will induct tonight, are scholars that are on the opposite end of their careers, historians of national reputation, from leading universities who are invited to present their current research to the public here in Georgia. Dooley Teaching Fellows receive a cash prize of $5,000, and they receive something very special and unique, a bust of Vince Dooley, sculpted by the renowned Georgia artist, artist Ross Rawson of Atlanta. And you can see the bust here on the table between, between the two chairs. The artist Ross Rawson gained national reputation for his portraits of figures such as Andrew Young, Maya Angelou, and Morgan Friedman, which today hang in the National Portrait Gallery, as well as his statue of Hank Aaron, 
which stands in the Braves, the Atlanta Braves new SunTrust Park in Cobb County. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the man for whom all of this is named, Vince Dooley, and I would like to ask him to join me on the stage for the induction ceremony. Vince? Well, thank you, uh, and thanks for coming this evening. Uh, the uh, Georgia Historical Society uh, has reached a point where it is uh, among the very best, and we think the best in all of, all of the United States of America. And that rise, <laughs> and it had an incredible rise in the last 20 plus years, thanks to the leadership of Todd Gross. And it was Todd's vision uh, to, uh, to have this fellowship program. Uh, as he mentioned, uh, I knew nothing about it. It was done uh, at the end of the annual gala that's held here. And it was a wonderful gala. And it was over, and I said, boy, it's been great but it's time to go home, go to bed. And all of a sudden, he started calling all of these people up here that uh, have been so generous in making this a reality. And then he announced it uh, to my surprise and my shock. And uh, I've, I've been speechless before in my life, but never as speechless as I was the other night, as you know. Uh, so, and then the next thing, that's this, this surprise, this um, shock, is when he told me that they were going to have the bust of me uh, as the, the, I don't know what, uh, the, the award trophy or whatever it is. <laughs> Todd showed, I didn't, this is the first time I've seen it, but Todd showed me a picture of it. And this guy, Rawson, is among the best. He did Hank Aaron, so I got all excited. But, but when I saw it, the only thing that's wrong with it is that it looks like me. Right? <laughs> but I'm proud of it, and uh, I can't uh, thank you enough, Todd. I can't thank uh, all of the people that, uh, that was responsible for making it happen. And then to, uh, on this very special night, uh, Dr. Blight, who um, is a distinguished professor, has done incredible work. Uh, a lot of it, uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Evans and his uh, wife, Linda, who, uh, who had the material that enabled him uh, to do the research. And that uh, was very special. He is a Yale man, so right away I connected with that because uh, the University of Georgia was patterned after Yale University. Uh, the first two presidents were Yale men. And also, the first two buildings were patterned after old college, a new college uh, at Yale University. And besides that, when we dedicated the stadium, the first game was to bring this great Yale team down uh, to Athens, uh, and we played them uh, in Sanford Stadium in 1929, and um, they had a uh, they had a running back named Ali Booth, who was a little fella but one of the great players. And they came down by train, and they would stop periodically, and crowds would come because Yale really had an incredible football team back in those days. But we had a fella named Catfish Smith, and. Uh, Catfish Smith scored all the points that enabled us to kick Yale's rear and send them back home. <laughs> and uh, the other connection, but it's not really a connection, um, is that uh, Yale are bulldogs and we're bulldogs. But we uh, were bulldogs a lot later afterwards. Uh, our first mascot was a goat. 
<laughs> but he only lasted uh, two days, I mean, two games, because in the second game, we were getting ready to play Auburn uh, this Saturday, and it was, uh, let's see, 1892 when that game was played. And Georgia had beaten Mercer earlier, so they were very overconfident. And uh, they went in, all the students and the alumni, and Auburn upset Georgia. And the students and alumni were so depressed, they barbecued the goat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was, it was Georgia's first tailgate, as a matter of fact. Well, uh, enough of that. Todd says that's enough. Uh, but thanks for coming. This is special. Con congratulations. Thank you, Vince. Well, it's now my honor, along with Coach Dooley, to induct the inaugural Vincent J. Dooley Distinguished Fellow, Dr. David W. Blight. Dr. Blight is the class of 1954 professor of American history and director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale University. He is the author or editor of 17 books, including his monumental and groundbreaking study, Race and Reunion, which completely changed how we understand the reunification of the nation after the Civil War. But it is not for his extensive teaching at Yale and his impressive academic achievement that he is being recognized tonight. He is also being recognized for his service to the Georgia Historical Society and through us, the people of Georgia and the nation. We first met David almost 15 years ago when he came to Savannah in January 2004 to participate in a federally funded Teaching American History program for Chatham County Public School teachers. He returned to Savannah in 2006 to participate in another Teaching American History program. In 2008, he came to Atlanta to the studios of Georgia Public Broadcasting to participate in a Georgia Historical Society Profiles in Leadership program on the Lincoln Bicentennial. In 2010, he spent two weeks with us as a visiting faculty for our National Endowment for the Humanities funded Summer Institute for University and College Faculty which focused on the Civil War 150th anniversary. And in 2017, he was the keynote speaker for our National Endowment funded Summer Institute for University and College Faculty, which focused on how we as a nation remember the past and memorialize history in public places. In all, Dr. Blight has helped the Georgia Historical Society train over 100 teachers, ranging from K through 12 teachers right here in Georgia, to university faculty from over 30 states in the union. His designation as the first duly distinguished fellow not only formalizes his relationship with the Georgia Historical Society, it also elevates this new program to the highest level of prestige, helping us to establish the Dooley Fellows as one of the premier academic recognitions in the nation. After his induction, Dr. Blight will join Georgia Historical Society senior historian, Dr. Stan Deaton, in a conversation about his latest book, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the podium the Vincent J. Dooley Distinguished Fellow of the Georgia Historical Society for the year 2018, Dr. David W. Blight. Congratulations. Thank briefly, briefly, briefly. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Todd. Thank you to all the board members, the Georgia Historical Society, and Coach Dooley. The truth is, I would have rather sat down there and just listened to Coach Dooley tell more <laughs> stories. They cooked the goat. <laughs> what he did not tell you is that in his last game as coach at Georgia, he defeated my alma mater in the Gator Bowl. I went to Michigan State. Uh, but I, I uh, just thought I'd point that out. We lost, you won. Um, this is a truly great honor. I mean, historians are just historians. We wander through archives and we write books. Uh, 
it's a very, very special thing to, to receive this first Dooley Fellowship. I've been to Savannah many, many times, and you're about to hear about why, and I plan to come back many, many more times. In fact, I need to get an apartment here uh, <laughs> soon. So thank you, Todd, to all your staff and to all the board. I'm deeply honored by this award. Um, thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll talk some history. Hi, David. Right? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Good evening. Welcome, everybody. As Todd said, my name is Stan Deaton. I'm the senior historian with the Georgia Historical Society. It's my pleasure to get to talk to David Black tonight. So we'll get right to it. Um, Frederick Douglass does not have a Georgia connection, but mm. your book has a very deep Savannah connection. I would like for you to tell the audience about uh, your meeting that changed the uh, directory of your professional yes. life, and what brings you here tonight? Well, thank you, Stan. Um, I've told this story many, many times. I'm on a book tour now that's been going on for weeks. And I've told the Walter and Linda, Linda Evans story many, many places, but never have I been allowed to say it here. So this is very special. Um, and what I learned today was March of 2006. <laughs> never trust your memory, because I thought it was 2008. I've been telling people it was 10 years ago, it was 12 years ago. I came to Savannah at the invitation of Stan and Todd to give a talk to local middle school and high school teachers about Frederick Douglass's narrative, his first autobiography, which I've done many times. And when I arrived, the way I remember it was, Stan or Todd said, there's a local gentleman here who's a collector. He'd like to go to lunch with us. And I said, fine, you know, that's, that's good. And at lunch, I met this extraordinary man, Walter Evans, who then, to make a long story short, took me over to his house on Jones Street, got out on his dining room table, at least portions of his Frederick Douglass collection. Now, Walter knew that I was a Douglass scholar because I wrote a first book on Douglass in graduate school decades ago. And that day, I didn't decide to write this biography that day because I was frankly rather traumatized by the extent of the collection. Uh, it took me a while uh, to make up my mind that I really wanted to take this on. I had no intention of writing a new full life of Frederick Douglass to take on this very complicated, long life of this great American until I encountered this collection. And within a year or so, I committed to doing that book. And I have been back to Savannah. I've lost count many, many times. I've spent four or five spring breaks here. I've spent many other weeks. Uh, I've lived in numerous B&Bs and hotels over on MLK Boulevard. And I've spent endless days doing research in about as special a place as I can ever imagine, which is on Lyndon Walter's dining room table. Uh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful archive, I must tell you. Uh, it's by private appointment only. <laughs> there are now many other Douglas scholars who've come to town, uh, many at my recommendation. Uh, they've been through Walter's initiation, and uh, they've been allowed to use the collection. The collection is extraordinary. We could say a few more things about that. But had I not encountered uh, Walter and Linda and that collection, I never would have written this book. And those of you who have bought it or will read it or have been reading it, just glance in the footnotes, you'll find Evan's collection hundreds of times. Um, and I must say, too, uh, Walter and Linda have become dear friends in a host of ways, uh, and the book is indeed dedicated to them. So David, tell us, if you will, what is in that collection uh, and what it allowed you to do as yeah. a biographer that previous biographers have not been able to do. Well, it's especially a collection about Douglas's family, extended family, uh, and about Douglas's public life as well. It's the core of the collection, 
and Walter will correct anything I get wrong here. Uh, the core of the collection are numerous, huge, uh, Douglas family scrapbooks that were kept primarily by Douglas's sons. Douglas had three surviving adult sons, one surviving adult daughter. The sons kept these scrapbooks over the last 30 or 35 years of their father's life. Douglas was born in 1818 in the eastern shore of Maryland. He lives all the way to 1895. And the scrapbooks are, have, have many, many interesting things in them, but especially they have thousands and thousands of newspaper clippings from newspapers you could not otherwise find. You can't, yeah, whether it's in archives or in digitized collections these days. And we have lots of digitized collections of newspapers these days, but you're not gonna find these kinds of clippings. Um, for example, uh, somewhere in the 1880s, I forget exactly when, the family hired a clipping service. I didn't even know there was a clipping service in the 19th century, but it was called the American Bureau. And suddenly, somewhere there in the 80s, these clippings that they pasted in, hundreds and hundreds of them, at the top say American Bureau. So everywhere Douglas went as an orator, a speaker, back would come at least one clipping. And I must say, Frederick Douglass was, and I say this in the book, possibly the most widely traveled American of the 19th century. Uh, he possibly, I mean, no one can ever measure this, nor would most people perhaps care, but he probably traveled more miles than any American of the 19th century, with the possible exception of Mark Twain. But Twain cheated, he went to Asia. Douglas was an itinerant traveling orator like no one else in that century, which was the golden age of oratory. And this collection of clippings allows a historian to document, to map the journeys Douglas makes year after year after year after year, as, a, as a, well, a, a, partly as an abolitionist earlier, but especially that final 30 years of his life. And I would add to that, and there's a hundred things I could say about the collection and what I gained from it, but it really opened up a window under the part of the great Frederick Douglass's life that we didn't know very well at all. If you, knew, if you know much about Frederick Douglass, if, if, if most Americans know Douglass, they tend to know him in the younger years. They know the famous slave who escapes from slavery and ends up writing his narrative and becomes an abolitionist. The young heroic Douglass is the one people tend to know. The older Douglas, the aging man, the patriarch of a huge extended family that became almost entirely dependent upon him. The man who went from being a radical political outsider to a political insider after the emancipation and the Civil War, who, who managed to become an insider in the Republican Party after the Civil War and a functionary of that party in Washington, D.C. after he moved there in 1872 is documented uh, like nowhere else in the Evans collection. It also opened up a window into understanding at least portions of what Douglas almost never wrote about which was his domestic, private, family life. Because in Evans' collection as well, there are a lot of family letters and family photographs and all sorts of family documents like marriage licenses and death notices and so on and so forth. And what one finds is a frankly rather modern story of a very complex, at times very troubled and sometimes even dysfunctional extended family. I won't go into all the good, bad, and the ugly of his extended family. But in the book, I call them, after he moves to Washington in 1872, there are many DC newspapers in those years, several black papers, several white papers. His extended family became what I ended up calling the black first family of Washington, DC. Everything they did, good, bad, and ugly, got into the press. Douglas woke up every day uh, after the middle of the 1870s wondering, what will they be writing today? 
about me, about my family, about my son who lost a job, about a bankruptcy here and a lawsuit there. And again, this collection allows one a window into that and to document it. And I have to say, as a biographer, what you are always looking for, even a, for a person whose life is seemingly so well documented, although the huge parts of this life that I would pray to have even more material about you, you, biography always feels infinite. There's always something else you could find. Your own life, if you think about it. You know, somebody may write your life, but what do they not know? <laughs> A lot, I, I would guess. But this collection allowed me pieces of texture, anecdotes, little stories here and little stories there. An interview we did out on the road in Iowa or Chicago or Cleveland. It allowed me to map his life and his journeys in ways that you just can't do without this particular collection. I didn't know where I was going at first. Walter remembers that. I just realized that, oh my God, this is an amazing collection. Somebody should try to do this. And so I, I started parking myself in Savannah. And of course, one of the good things about coming to Savannah, if you come in March, if you come the right week, <laughs> you, know, you know the end of that sentence. I got to see the first one was unbelievable to me. By the second one, I knew what I was in for. I got to see the St. Patrick's Day Parade twice. And I got to follow Lyndon Walter around. It was like following the mayor of Savannah around, one party after another. I couldn't believe it. I went to the airport that first time, and I was not steady. You know what I mean? No, what, what, what he wouldn't allow me to do research on St. Patrick's Day. I said, no, no, you can go ahead to the parade. I'll just work. No, you won't. You're coming to the parade. So anyway. Sorry. <laughs> I don't want to interrupt that, no. No, but and that's true, by the way. I, I, I would have done, I would have worked. But. So we talked earlier today about Douglas is born in, in 1818. He spends the first 20 years of his life enslaved. He escapes from slavery. He does not have a day of formal schooling. Yeah. And yet words become his entire life. Right. They did indeed. Uh, if... If we're talking about Frederick Douglass tonight and someone is talking about him in 50 years or 100 years, it is because of words. We know Frederick Douglass because of what he wrote and what he spoke. Uh, we know him because he heroically escaped from slavery and all that too. But he wrote 1,200 pages of autobiography, three autobiographies, uh, biographies. And by the way, that's the first problem any biographer of Frederick Douglass faces. The subject is always in your way. The autobiographies are there trying to control you at every step and you have to keep trying to see through them, under them, around them, over them. He's manipulating you as his biographer on every page and he's a genius with words and sometimes you just want to grab him by the collar, sit him down in a seminar room, lock the doors and for six hours without bathroom breaks ask about all the things he did not tell us in those autobiographies. But every time I've tried that he just vanishes. <laughs> anyway, words. Um, in, on the page and in oratory uh, Douglas was a genius with words, and of course, the question is then, how, how does a slave, former slave, never a day in a schoolroom in his life, uh, achieve this? It might seem like a set of miracles. It's not a miracle. There are mysteries in it. I mean, there are mysteries to every great writer. I mean, think of your favorite writer, whoever it is. Charles Dickens, Toni Morrison, I, you name your, your, your favorite writer. Jane Austen, where did that genius with words come from? It, it came from experience, learning, schooling, writing. It came from life. A writer writes about life. In this case, and I'll be brief with this, D D Douglas encountered words and language when he was only a child. He had the great good fortune of being taught his alphabet and letters by his mistress, Sophia Auld, in Baltimore when he was seven, eight, and maybe nine years old, until her husband, Hugh Auld, forced her to stop teaching him. 
because you weren't supposed to teach a slave boy to read. As Douglas remembered the episode, he remembered Hewald walking into the room, and here's Sophia, who to Douglas had become like a mother figure, and like a, he called her an angelic figure, because she taught him and read with him every day, and the kid loved words and language. Hewald comes in and says, you teach that kid to read, and he's gonna wanna write. And Douglas later, always the ironist, said, that was the first anti-slavery speech I ever heard. If these people think words and language are so important, then I'm, I'm, I need to get some more of that. And he just fell in love with words. Uh, and in the streets of Baltimore, when he's nine and 10 years old, he encounters all these little white boys. And they're almost all immigrants. They're all Irish and German kids who haven't learned racism sufficiently yet. And they befriend him. But they all are carrying a little book with them called the Columbian Order. This magical little book, the first possession really Douglas ever owned, and one of only two possessions he would carry out of slavery with him. The Columbian Order was published, or assembled and published by a New England uh, schoolmaster named Caleb Bingham in, eight, in 18, nine, I'm sorry, 1797. Uh, I put a new edition of it back in print at its 200th anniversary in 1997. But that's an amazing book. Uh, it's, it's a collection of lots of oratory from both the classical era, the Greeks and the Romans, but also especially from the Enlightenment era, British and American orators. But even more importantly for little Frederick, the first 20 pages is, is, is like a manual of oratory. It's a how-to. It has explanations about how you learn to modulate your voice as an orator, how you begin to you go from quiet to louder, and how you build to, to crescendos. And it has, it has explanations of how to use your shoulders and your neck and your arms, the physicality of oratory. And then it has moral lessons, which I think Bingham was getting basically from Aristotle, but it's the idea that an orator, a speaker, should aim for a moral point of view, that he needs to make penetration to the heart of his audience with a moral argument. Well, Douglas didn't get all that right away, but he managed to buy his own copy when he was either 11 or 12 from a bookstore in Fells Point in Baltimore. And that book became magic for him. He started assembling other, you know, newspapers and magazines or whatever he could get, and he, he slept in a loft at the Alds house. And then he's sent back to the Eastern Shore. He becomes a field hand. He is brutalized and whipped savagely by one of the people he was hired out to, and then had the great good luck of his owner, Thomas Ald, eventually sending him back to Baltimore when he was about 17. And the fact that Douglas lived nearly half of his 20 years as a slave in a city like Baltimore, which was a big ocean port, a big window on the world. It was a big shipbuilding port. And, and he was always watching the maritime world come into that port. And in that city, he was uh, one of about 3,000 slaves a total population in the city, uh, the year he escaped in 1838, of about 130,000. But there were 17,000 free blacks in Baltimore. By far, the largest part of the black community of that city were free. They had virtually no rights. Their lives were circumscribed. Uh, but they built a community. They had churches. They had their own underground economy. They had all kinds of, they had debating societies. He was, he was in a debating society when he was 17. He went to four different churches, uh, two black and two white, and he even told, he gives us the names of all the preachers, and he ranks them, the ones he liked and the ones he didn't, the same thing we do with churches. Uh, oops. But he was a Methodist, he was. He was actually, if, if he had a denomination, he was a Methodist. At any rate, language wasn't just the thing he got from his mistress, but that really matters. It wasn't just the thing he got out of this Columbian Order book with that really matters, but he started hearing language and sermons in these churches. 
And then he met an old black preacher when he was probably about 13 or 14. He doesn't tell us exactly how long this relationship went on. There's an old black preacher in Baltimore whose name was uh, Charles Lawson. He called him alternately uh, Uncle Lawson or Father Lawson. And Father Lawson was a drayman by day, which means he drove a cart for whatever coins he could make. But he loved the Bible. Lawson was a fanatic about, learn, about telling and learning more about the, the, the stories of the Bible, especially the Old Testament. And when he found this kid, this 13-year-old who could read, he sat him down, and Douglas, it appears, was mesmerized by this old man. And, he, he, and Douglas would read aloud to Lawson for hours and hours and hours from the Bible. Stories from the Bible. So, Long before Douglas escapes from slavery at age 20, he has been hearing language in his head and reading it. And the language he learns that echoes in his head is the King James Version. It's the King James cadences of the Bible. Such that when he escapes from slavery and he and his wife Anna, uh, after they made it to New York City, immediately go up to New Bedford, Massachusetts. And I met somebody signing here earlier who's from New Bedford. Here's to New Bedford. It was a, it was a great enclave of, of fugitive slaves. It was, it was the great whaling port. It was the American whaling port. The first great American industry was whaling, not cotton. Cotton surpassed it. But in New Bedford, he spends three years. He worked all kinds of odd jobs. He was a carpenter here, and he, he carried whale oil casts. He got jobs down on the docks. He worked in a, in a, in a forge where, the, where he worked the bellows. You know, you have to keep busting that thing up and down, up and down. And he tells us he would put on the post next to the bellows a copy of the Liberator. William Lloyd Garrison's anti-slavery newspaper. So he could work the bellows with one arm and read the newspaper with the other. But by, at the age of about 21, he started going to the local AME uh, Zion Church. Little Zion, they called it. It's the black church in New Bedford. A fugitive slave church. And clearly, we don't know exactly when and how, but somebody there realized this kid could preach. And they, they got him in the pulpit. And by 1839 and 1840, he's an occasional preacher at the AME church. And he learned very quickly the, the, the homiletics of whatever the text was that week, he preached on it. And it's there where he was, in effect, discovered by some white abolitionists from up in Massachusetts who found this, this very young black guy uh, preaching at that church, and they invited him out to Nantucket to a big anti-slavery convention in August of 1841 when he's 23 years old and invited him to come tell his story, come and speak. Now, he did not leave slavery this well-formed orator, and certainly not yet a writer. He could write, for sure. He's got a lot to learn yet, and he's going to get help. He's not a pure genius that just burst, you know, out of some shell. Nobody is. He learned oratory by practicing it over and over, and he learned it by hearing it. And he learned writing by really practicing even more. But even at that tender young age, Douglas was discovering that words could be a weapon, and it would become the only weapon he ever really had. And from that first speech in 1841 to a room full of white people in Nantucket, for the next 50 years, uh, he sustained uh, the greatest career of oratory, perhaps, in all of American history. Uh, but not because he was just a genius at it, but because he practiced it and practiced it and practiced it. And actually, in Walter's collection, he has several texts of Douglas' speeches. Uh, and it's interesting. Uh, one might think of a Frederick Douglass as just a spontaneous orator. Just take, this, take the podium and hold forth for two hours without notes. No. He wrote texts of most of his speeches. It doesn't mean he didn't break from the text and, and bust the lights out once in a while. But there are 
very careful texts of almost all of his major speeches showing us, and I'm convinced of this actually, Stan and I were talking about this earlier, Douglas is one of those people that a lot of us know, and maybe it's you. He didn't know what he really thought about something until he wrote it. I mean, he could get up and he could get up and make your ears ring for quite a while, and he could stun you. But when he was troubled, when he was in the middle of a crisis, the nation was in a crisis. There's a huge event going on. There's a catastrophe, a disaster, a triumph, whatever. Douglas would go to his desk. And out would come a speech, and he'd take it on the road. When he could write it down, he kind of then knew what he thought. All of that's a way of saying, th there's nothing, uh, I call him a genius with words, because, uh, you know, whatever genius is, we should use that word carefully, but he's one of them. But it didn't just come out of some miracle. It came out of a process. It came out of a history. It came out of his learning, his hearing, and his reading. He started collecting books as early as he possibly could, and he had some people who helped him actually buy and create his book collection. And that book collection is today out in a warehouse in Landover, Maryland. The National Park Service owns it. It's amazing. And what, be what became of his copy of the Columbian Orator? Oh, well, <laughs> I skipped over that, didn't I? Uh, when Douglas escaped from slavery in August of 1838, dressed in a sailor's suit with a big brimmed hat and a black cravat and uh, borrowed sailor's maritime papers of an old black sailor he happened to know. Uh, he had essentially only two possessions. In one pocket he had a little bit of money that he managed to save up from the jobs he worked and that his betrothed, Anna Murray, uh, probably gave him. And in the other pocket he had the Colombian Order. And that very copy of Douglas's Columbian Order is today at Cedar Hill, uh, his house in Washington that's run now by the National Park Service. And I got to know the curators there uh, very well over the years, especially uh, Kamal McLaren, who became my, I call him my angel of Cedar Hill. Um, uh, one day after hours, they were closing, it was winter time, it was 5 p.m., and they just let me alone in the house. And with, with some supervision. But with white gloves on, I got to sit at his desk, I got to hold the books, and I got to hold and open Douglas's own copy of the Columbian Order. That may seem weird to some of you who don't do these kinds of strange things with dusty documents and smelly old books, but uh, that was a, a deeply moving sort of moment. I got to hold his copy of that book, uh, which was a little discolored and watered on the edges, but. And it was a Maryland edition. The fact that in the slave state of Maryland, they published that book with all those anti-slavery speeches in it. I thought, no, that's interesting. Who, who made that happen? But uh, that, that book is still there. Let me read some of Douglas's words about struggle. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. This struggle may be a moral one or it may be a physical one, and it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Yeah, that has perhaps become the most famous quote from Douglas. Uh, it's worth saying first, it's context. Uh, it's the late 1850s. The context here is after the Dred Scott case. The Supreme Court decision that ruled that black people could never be citizens of the United States had no rights that white people need acknowledge, and in effect, the court had said, black people have no future in America. It's at the time when some in free black communities in the North were considering all sorts of emigration schemes to leave the United States. Although Douglas never quite shouldered up to that, although he flirted with it. It was a desperate time of fear. If you know, if you know your 1850s, this is the road to the Civil War. 
the political parties are ripping themselves apart. Uh, and Douglas laid that, that line, down, those lines down in that kind of context. He also at that time uh, has undergone a transformation ideologically. He's transformed by then into a thoroughgoing political abolitionist. That is, he's no longer merely a moralist, a follower of William Lloyd Garrison, or what they called a moral suasionist. That strategy against slavery, though no less radical, uh, believed that you should only try to change human hearts and minds and not try to change the laws through politics. That you, you could only really change society by changing hearts and minds. Douglas had put that behind, and he not only had embraced politics, political parties, he had even begun to embrace the possible uses of violence against slavery. And you can, you can feel and hear that in those words. It might be a physical struggle, it might be a moral struggle, but it will be a struggle. Now, I'd, I'd also just say quickly there, and you may be going there with the next question, Stan, and I don't wanna, <laughs> I don't wanna anticipate, but that passage, if you heard it, which I've even seen now on a placemat, in a restaurant, which got me really worried, you know, when, when, when those great words appear on a placemat somewhere, it, it gets me worried, it's like they're trivialized. And get that off the placemat, put it on the wall, you know. Anyway, but what that is is an example of how Douglas could capture in words the meaning of something. The meaning of an event, the meaning of a dilemma, the meaning of a problem, the meaning of a crisis, the meaning of a catastrophe or a victory. He had that capacity with words that we sometimes associate with prophets. And it's why it took me a, a quite a while to, to get up the courage to put the word prophet in the title of my book, because that's an awfully big word, right? We hear a lot about prophets in churches for good reason. We read them. And believe me, Douglas had read the Hebrew prophets. His favorite was Isaiah, his second favorite was Jeremiah, and then Ezekiel came through. I've done counts of the numbers of times he invoked these Hebrew prophets, but a prophet is that person who somehow finds the words not to predict things. That's a, that's a profane use, actually, of the word prophet. Prophets often predict things wrong. But prophets are those people, they're rare, and they should be rare, who find the language to explain to us what's happening to us. And often what they say to us will really trouble us. Well, it might even drive us crazy, it might even make us run away, it might make us hide from Jeremiah or Ezekiel in the Valley of the Dry Bones but they're the words that make us think. Douglas had that capacity. If you read Douglas carefully at all in the speeches, in the autobiographies, and, and I, I argue especially in his editorials. This man edited his own anti-slavery newspaper for 16 years. He wrote hundreds and hundreds of the short form editorials. He mastered that genre too. There are passages in some of those editorials about the great political crises of the 1850s that just just bust you in the face, just stun you. And you realize, oh my goodness, he captured that. That passage comes out of one of those kinds of crisis moments. It's the late 1850s. He is in, he's in the midst of a long-term kind of decision about just how and whether to support John Brown. And he came very close to supporting John Brown, but thankfully had the great good sense not to. Um, we could talk more on that if we had any time. Um, but it's, it's a good example of the way he simply found both a music with words, but then explanations with words. He wasn't just the orator who could, you know, fashion pretty words. They were words that analyzed. We're going to open this up to questions now. You and I could talk for hours. Great. But um, but we have to let them in on it, huh? We, we want to let our audience <laughs> ask questions as well. Elise and Lisa have microphones. If you will raise your hand, they will come to you. We've got about 10 minutes for questions before we close out.
Could you talk about the relationship between Lincoln and Douglas? How did they influence each other? Right. How did they interact? Sure. Uh, Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass met three times in person. Once in August of 1863 at the White House, once in August of 1864 at the White House, and then right after the second inaugural and the reception at the White House uh, in March of 1865. Uh, they never encounter one another, even in print, until the late 1850s, really, although it's possible Lincoln had read some of Douglas before that. Douglas got very interested in Lincoln from the newspaper coverage of the Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858, because by then, Douglas was, was shouldering up to the Republican Party, or trying to. They were never radical enough for him, but they very much excited him, because that Republican Party, though it, it seemed moderate, compared to radical abolitionists, it was opposed to the expansion of slavery, it was opposed to the future of slavery, and most important, it really threatened Southerners. And if white Southerners were threatened by this Republican Party, Douglas saw it as a good, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So he began to, he was very interested in this guy Lincoln, after those Lincoln-Douglas debates. And then in 1860, when Lincoln gets the nomination, uh, Douglas supported Lincoln in New York State, uh, but only kind of modestly. He wasn't sure yet about the Republican Party. He just didn't know whether to trust their anti-slavery sensibilities. But most important was this relationship they forged. It wasn't a deep friendship by any means, and there are people who have tried to imply that. There are only three meetings of a total of probably an hour and a half. The first one was Douglas, in August of 63, Douglas just went to Washington to protest the discriminations, the unequal pay, the brutal discriminations against black soldiers in the Union Army, because he's been out on the, on the stump recruiting black soldiers ever since spring and all summer for the 54th Massachusetts Regiment and for other regiments, only to discover that they're all serving under brutal conditions of discrimination. He went to Washington without any appointment. He just got in line at the White House. And if you know your Lincoln history at all, this was a common thing. People just lined up to talk to the president. He got in line, he put his card ahead, and lo and behold, the president wrote or sent somebody out and said, send him in. That's the first time they met. Douglas left that day after no more than probably a half hour meeting, having laid his protest at the feet of the president, and he ha they had what, you know, the diplomats call a good exchange of ideas. Lincoln made no promises, but he did walk out of there saying that he'd never met a white man who treated him so honestly. I think Douglas was frankly awed by Lincoln that first time he met him. He saw a certain authenticity in Lincoln. The second time they meet, and this is the important one, is a year later. The condition of the war is very different. I don't have time to go into all that. But this time, Lincoln invites Douglas, as the principal spokesman of black Americans, to come to Washington to meet with him. It's mid-August, 1864. If you know your war chronology, you know what's going on. It's terrible stalemate in Virginia, terrible stalemate in Georgia before Atlanta. Uh, General Sheridan's moves down the Shenandoah Valley have not happened yet. And Admiral Farragut has not yet taken Mobile Bay. Lincoln invited Frederick Douglass to the White House and asked, looked Douglass in the eye and asked him, would you be the principal agent amongst many other agents whom you will organize to help us get as many slaves out of the, particularly the Upper South, behind Union lines, into, into the Union Army, and behind Union lines to f legal freedom before I lose the election in the fall. Because at that point, Douglas had every reason to believe he probably would not be reelected. The war weariness, the condition of the war was such, there was no good reason to believe Lincoln's going to win in November. Douglas left there that day, again, stunned and awed. He's just been asked to be John Brown. 
And he went back to Rochester, New York, and he started sending telegrams and letters to abolitionist friends and others, and he had like 20 people who were supposed to join him as agents and funneling slaves out of the South. And then came the fall of Atlanta. And then came, well, even before that, Farragut took Mobile Bay. Then came the fall of Atlanta. Then comes Sheridan moving down the Shenandoah. And uh, these were huge turning points in the war, especially the fall of Atlanta. Sorry, we're in Georgia. But that turned the tide in national or northern morale. And the prospects of Lincoln's reelection improved. They won't meet again, though, until uh, Inauguration Day, the second inaugural. Douglas went to Washington, stood in the crowd, off to, the, off to Lincoln's left. He's in, if you see those photographs, Douglas is right down there. He's about 10 or 15 people back. He heard the second inaugural. And then after the speech was over, Douglas, with one companion, got in the lines up Pennsylvania Avenue. He walked behind the presidential carriage with mobs of other, not mobs, but crowds of other people all the way to the White House. He had no invitation to the reception. But he just decided, I'm gonna go anyway. <laughs> he went and got in line. The officers, you know, the, the, the police uh, wouldn't let him in. And the way Douglas tells the story is, and this is the only source we have on this. Well, actually, there's two others. But anyway, he says, he said, tell the president Frederick Douglass is here. Somebody went back and told Lincoln. He told him this huge reception in the East Room. Somebody came out and got him. He went in. And Douglass tells the story of how Lincoln's head was up above all the rest of the crowd, you know. And Douglass, too, was six, six one and a half. And he says, Lincoln spies him across the room and motions to him, and they meet. And Lincoln said to Douglas, Mr. Douglas, I want to know what you thought of my speech. No, Mr. President, Douglas said, oh, tend to all your guests. No, Douglas, I value no one's opinion more than you. At least that's what Douglas said he said. <laughs> Wouldn't we all on the moment where you, we, meet, we meet Lincoln and we get to say something to him? But then, and then Lincoln said to him, no, I want to know what you think. So Douglas says, so I told him, Mr. President, that was a sacred effort. The second inaugural, which is a sacred speech. It's a very biblical speech. Then he got an invitation from Lincoln to go have tea. About two weeks later, at the soldier's home in Washington, which is where Lincoln would go by carriage. It was a little higher ground, it was a little cooler as a retreat. Douglas couldn't take the invitation because he had a speaking appointment. And of course the assassination happened in the second week of April. There would have been a fourth meeting and it would have been a much longer meeting because it would have been over tea, but that one never happened. But I'll just say lastly that Douglas lived to write three very different kinds of Lincoln eulogy speeches over the years. He invented the Lincoln he needed at any given time, which is what most of us still do with Lincoln. Um, we, a long uh, answer. Well, we have time for one question oh on that dear. side. Yeah, David is going to be signing books. You're going to have to read this book, I guess. That's so. a shame. But, mm. <laughs> Sir. Yes. Uh, if I'm incorrect, I know you'll correct me. In 1872, wasn't he matched up with Victoria Woodhill as a vice presidential candidate? which made it very interesting because she was the leader of the women's suffrage along with Susan yeah. B. Anthony. Yeah. And of course, uh, Frederick Douglass, the first, I believe, I think, any black gentleman to be nominated for a national office. Was that not true? Yes, it's true. He was technically nominated to run as vice president with, with Victoria Woodhull in eight, 1872. But he, to be quite honest, he barely acknowledged it. And he did not campaign. And he was at that time in the midst of a very difficult, bitter breakup with Susan Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the two principal leaders of women's suffrage, because of the nature of the 15th Amendment. We could go into that uh, if we wanted to. But yes, it's true. He was nominated to be uh, 
vice president on that ticket, but the ticket amounted to really little at all, and he he hardly even wrote about it in his autobiography. It wasn't something he stressed. We like to stress that today as a kind of almost wishful thinking. Why didn't Douglas become vice president? Why didn't Douglas become a senator? Why didn't he do this, and why couldn't he have done that? Uh, because it was the 19th century. Not the only state that's done that. But. Well, <laughs> all right. David, let me take the MC's privilege here just to say. Sure. Um, this book is 764 pages. Oh, did you have to tell them that? It's, it's a, but 30, you can work 30, out with it. 31 it, it, chapters, you can, 888 pages total. And I've uh -huh. read every word of it. He this. has. It's amazing. And He's really read it. it. It is a, truly, it is a stunning, towering achievement of a historian who's at the top of his game. There will be awards coming for this book, one next April, I think, which shall go unnamed so that I don't jinx you, but uh, don't Don't jinx that. I don't know what you're talking about. Don't talk about that. It starts with a P. Congratulations no, 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 on no, no, the no. publication. Congratulations on being the inaugural duly distinguished fellow. Thank you for all you've done for the Georgia Historical Society and for all of us for giving us this remarkable story to Walter Evans for collecting it making it available to you and through you to all of us. Thank you very much. Well, thank you.